Hello and welcome to Current News. My name is Neil. In this special segment, we will discuss news which is important from the perspective of your exam. The bulletin of the last whole week which might echo in your question paper in the examination hall. Let's begin with the headlines. Supreme Court recognizes sex work as a profession. Sex workers entitled to equal protection under the law. SC instructs the police not to misbehave with sex workers. Supreme Court orders release of Rajiv Gandhi's assassination convict. Judgment delivered under Article 142. Article 142 also invoked in several cases in the past. The US launches Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. It aims at countering China. It will also aid in building strong trade relations with the countries of the Indo-Pacific region. DBT releases guidelines for safety assessment of genome edited plants 2022. Researchers exempted from seeking GEAC approval for plant genome modification. It aims at simplifying the criteria for GM crop research. And International Labour Organization publishes the 9th edition of World of Work report. 11 crore job losses claimed in the last 6 months. The report criticizes unemployment prevailing in India. Now let's begin with news of the week. Recently, the Supreme Court delivered a major verdict regarding sex workers' rights. While hearing a petition considering the problems of sex workers, the court has given a strict instructions to the police not to misbehave with them. The court directed the police not to verbally or physically abuse sex workers. Police in all states and union territories has also been directed to treat sex workers with respect. While issuing the directions, the court stated that the sex workers are entitled to same constitutional protection which is enjoyed by all people of India. According to the court, sex workers are also entitled to equal protection under the law. Referring to Article 21 of the Constitution of India, the court stated that every person in India has the right to live a dignified life. The court also underscored that criminal law should be applied equally to all cases based on age and consent. When it is clear that the sex worker is an adult and is participating with consent, the police must refrain from interfering or taking any criminal action. The court held that the child of a sex worker cannot be separated from the mother merely on the ground that she is engaged in prostitution as the right to basic protection of human decency and dignity extends to sex workers and their children as well. Besides, the court also issued directions to the media. The court stressed that the Press Council of India should issue appropriate guidelines so that the identities of sex workers during arrest, raid and rescue operations are not disclosed. Also, not to publish or telecast any photos that would result in disclosure of such identities. While issuing instructions to the states, the court directed them to survey shelter homes. The detention of adult women in such cases should be reviewed and action must be taken for their timely release. This is a significant order of Supreme Court in recognizing sex work as a profession. Recently, the Supreme Court gave a major verdict invoking Article 142 of the Constitution of India. Under Article 142, the Apex Court ordered the release of A.G. Perari Valan, a convict in assassination case of former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. However, A.G. Perari Valan, who has been incarcerated for more than 30 years, was out on bail granted by the Supreme Court. It is noteworthy that the Tamil Nadu cabinet had recommended the release of all seven convicts involved in the Rajiv Gandhi assassination case to the then governor in 2018 under Article 161 of the Constitution. The governor, however, continued to sit on the recommendations for almost two and a half years. Later, this recommendation was sent by the governor office to the president where it was lying ever since. Article 161 of the Constitution deals with the judicial powers of the governor under which the governor can pardon the punishment of any convicted person of the state. Moreover, as per the Supreme Court's verdict given in Maruram and Samshir Singh cases, the governor is bound to accept the advice or recommendation of the State Council of Ministers in the matter of remission of sentences. However, both of these procedures were not followed in the Perari Valens case. Hence, the Supreme Court exercised the special powers conferred on it under Article 142 of the Constitution. 
under article 142 the supreme court is empowered to exercise its jurisdiction to pass decrees or pass such orders as may be necessary to do complete justice in any matter pending before it the apex court had earlier delivered judgments invoking article 142 in several cases including bhopal gas tragedy ayodhya ram temple dispute and admission of a dalit student in iit bombay Recently, the Interest Rate Council and its standing committee were reconstituted. Earlier, five cabinet ministers were invited permanently to the Interest Rate Council. Henceforth, ten union ministers will be permanent invitees to the Interest Rate Council. The union ministers who were made permanent invitees of the council include the Labour Minister, Law and Justice Minister and Jal Shakti Minister. Besides, some changes were also introduced in the standing committee of the Interest Rate Council. Till now, the chief ministers of six states were included in this committee. Henceforth, chief ministers of eight states will be included in this committee. The chief ministers of Andhra Pradesh, Assam, Bihar, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Odisha, Punjab and Uttar Pradesh are also members of a standing committee of the Interstate Council. Union Home Minister Shri Amit Shah has been appointed as the chairman of this committee. It is worth mentioning that the Interstate Council is a constitutional body which has been mentioned in Article 263 of the Constitution of India. The President has the right to constitute the Interstate Council. It was established in May 1990 by the then National Front Government. This council plays a cardinal role in strengthening the centre-state relations, promoting and supporting cooperative federalism. The Prime Minister of India is the Chairman of Interstate Council. Interstate Council consists of Chief Ministers of the States, Chief Ministers or Administrators of the Union Territories and six Union Cabinet Ministers and ten Invited Ministers. The Standing Committee of Interstate Council was also formed in 1990 for the Council's smooth functioning. This committee used to consist of five Cabinet Ministers and Chief Ministers of six states but now the number of Chief Ministers of states have been increased to eight. The Prime Minister nominates the Chief Ministers of the states. The membership of chief ministers in the standing committee changes every year to give preference to each state. The Department of School Education and Literacy, Ministry of Education, recently released the NAS, that is, National Achievement Survey 2021 report. This report makes a comprehensive assessment of the learning competencies of the students studying in 3rd, 5th, 8th and 10th grades over three years. It also reflects the overall assessment of the school education system in the country. The last National Achievement Survey report was released in 2017. The survey was conducted at an All India level on 12th November 2021. The survey covered central and state government schools, government aided schools, and private unaided schools. Around 34 lakh students from 1.18 lakh schools in 720 districts located in both rural and urban areas participated in this survey. During this survey, the ability of students of 3rd and 5th classes to learn subjects such as language, mathematics and environmental studies was assessed. Simultaneously, the understanding of subjects like language, mathematics, science and social science of the students in class 8th was assessed. The proficiency of the students of 10th grade in subjects like language, mathematics, science, social science and English was assessed. It is worth mentioning that this nationwide survey was conducted by CBSC and it was managed through a technology platform designed and developed by NIC, that is National Informatics Center. This survey evaluates the progress and learning ability of children as an indicator of the efficiency of the education system. Hence, based on survey's findings, necessary remedial measures can be taken at different levels of school education. Recently, the IPEF, that is Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, was unveiled by the US President Joe Biden. It aims at strengthening the economic partnership between member countries to promote resilience, stability, inclusivity, neutrality, competitiveness and economic development in the Indo-Pacific region. Framework was launched a day before Quad's recent meeting. Thirteen countries, including India, have agreed to join this framework. In fact, the US has launched the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to establish strong trade and supply chain ties with Japan, India and Southeast Asia for countering China in the Indo-Pacific region. The IPEF is also seen as a means by which the US is trying to regain credibility in the region after former President Donald Trump pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
According to an insight paper on IPEF put out by US Congressional Research Service, the IPEF is not a traditional trade agreement. Rather, it would include different modules covering fair and resilient trade, supply chain resilience, infrastructure and decarbonization, and tax and anti-corruption. The countries joining the IPEF will have to sign up all the components within a module. However, a member country doesn't need to participate in all the modules. Out of these four modules, the Fair and Resilient Trade module will be led by the US Trade Representative. It will cover digital, labor and environmental issues with some binding commitments. Joe Biden had first mentioned the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework at the East Asia Summit held in October 2021. Recently, an investment incentive agreement has been signed between India and the United States. The agreement was signed by India's Foreign Secretary Vinay Quatra and Scott Nathan, the CEO of US International Development Finance Corporation or DFC. This agreement would lead to enhanced investment support provided by DFC in India, which shall further help in India's development. It is to be noted that agreement has been signed to keep pace with the additional investment support programs offered by the DFC. These include debt equity investment, investment insurance or reinsurance, etc. In fact, this agreement supersedes the Investment Incentive Agreement signed in 1997. Development Finance Corporation or its predecessor agencies have been providing investment support to India since 1974. So far, they have made investment support worth $5.8 billion to India. Investment support has been provided in sectors such as COVID-19, vaccine manufacturing, healthcare financing, renewable energy, SME financing, financial inclusion, infrastructure, etc. Recently, the Rajya Sabha MP Jairam Ramesh criticized the provisions of Biological Diversity Amendment Bill 2021. The bill was introduced in Parliament by the Union Environment Minister in December 2021 and it is currently being reviewed by a joint parliamentary committee. Registered Ayush practitioners are being granted several concessions in the amended bill. The bill seeks to exempt registered Ayush medical practitioners from giving prior intimation to state biodiversity boards for assessing biological resources for certain purposes. Against this backdrop, if a registered Ayush practitioner has informal links with the company structure, it can lead to potential abuse of the law. Moreover, according to Mr. Jairam Ramesh, multiple provisions of the bill were aimed at diluting the authority of National Biodiversity Authority or NBA. For instance, the companies need not seek the approval of the NBA when applying for a patent. Besides, the bill also decriminalized violations such as biopiracy and made them civil offenses. This could lead to misuse of law and defeated the act's deterrent powers. Biopiracy is a practice of exploiting genetic or biochemical resources for commercial gains. In biopiracy, researchers or research organizations earn profit by trading biological resources without official approval. The Biological Diversity Amendment Bill 2021 was introduced to relax certain provisions of the Biological Diversity Act 2002. Indian medical practitioners, industries and researchers need to comply with various standards under the provisions of the 2002 Act. This amendment bill has been introduced for relaxing these standards and for simplifying research, investment and patent application process in this sector. Recently, DBT, that is Department of Biotechnology, has released guidelines for safety assessment of genome-edited plants 2022. It aims at easing the norms for research into genetically modified crops. Also, it will foster circumventing challenges of using foreign genes to change crops profile. Recent guidelines exempt researchers who use gene editing technology to modify the genome of the plant from seeking approval from the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee or GEAC. In addition, these guidelines also exempt researchers from seeking permission from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change for research. It must be mentioned that these guidelines provide a roadmap for the sustainable use of genome editing technologies. These guidelines apply to public and private sector research institutions engaged in plant genome editing research. Transgenic technology is often used for genome editing of a plant. In this technique, the genes of other species are added to the plant. For example, soil bacterial genes are used for protecting Bt cotton plants from the attack of insects. Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee is an expert body of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. The GEAC evaluates research into GM plants 
and recommends or disapproves their release into farmer fields. The final call, however, is taken by the Environment Minister as well as states where such plants could be cultivated. Recently, a paper was published in the Agriculture Journal of MPDI, that is Multidisciplinary Digital Publishing Institute. The paper is titled Utilizing Mediterranean Plants to Remove Contaminants from the Soil Environment. A short review. This paper discusses about more sustainable and eco friendly phytoremediation techniques of soil treatment and the hyper accumulator plants used in these techniques. At present, soil pollution is a serious issue. Comprehensive changes in land use, soil erosion, excessive use of pesticides and fertilizers, industrial and urban waste, etc., are responsible for soil pollution. Heavy metals are also being found in soil, which causes various diseases. Phytoremediation is a technique of soil treatment. In phytoremediation, toxic heavy substances present in the soil are separated using plants. These plants absorb toxins from the soil and store them in their tissues like leaves and stems. Hyperaccumulator plants, which are used in phytoremediation, can absorb pollutants in higher quantities than normal plants. At present, several new hyperaccumulator plants have been identified in various parts of the world, including the Mediterranean region, Brazil, Cuba, New Caledonia, and Southeast Asia. Hyperaccumulator plants can be used to remove metals such as silver, cadmium, cobalt, chromium, copper, mercury, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, lead, and zinc from the soil. Recently, the ninth edition of the World of Work report was released by the ILO, that is International Labour Organization. The report mentions that around 11 crore people lost their jobs globally from the last quarter of 2021 to the first quarter of 2022. Besides, it also states that COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the already substantial gender imbalances with respect to working hours in the employment. During this period, for every 100 women at work prior to pandemic, 12.3 women would have lost their job, while for every 100 men, the equivalent figure would have been 7.5. Women working in the informal sector have been worst affected by the increasing gender disparity in workforce. However, the report also claims that this gender gap is more pronounced in lower and middle income countries, while countries with high income or developed economies have narrowed this gap. India's employment scenario has been called dismal in this report. A potent reason is that most of the people in India work under contract without any social security. A survey by the Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises has also revealed that about a third of India's micro, small and medium enterprises were completely destroyed during the pandemic. This report suggests that India should adopt decent jobs and decent wages to improve the purchasing capacity of their workers. It is to be noted that code on wages was passed in India in 2019, but it is yet to be implemented. Besides, the minimum wage recommended by the Wage Committee in 1948 has not been adopted in India. Recently, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology organized a session on Digital India, Bhashini, under the National Language Translation Mission. On this occasion, a brainstorming session was conducted with various researchers and startups to shape a strategy for Digital India, Bhashini. Bhashini stands for Bhasha Interface for India. It is an open digital platform that brings together industries, educational institutions, research groups, startups, etc. on a single platform. It aims at making their research and contributions available in the public domain. This forum will make artificial intelligence and natural language processing resources available to MSMEs, startups, and individual innovators. It is worth mentioning that Digital India Bhashini aims to substantially increase the content in Indian languages, particularly in domains of governance, policy, science, and technology. This mission aims to empower Indian citizens by connecting them to digital initiatives of the country in their own language, thereby leading to digital inclusion, consequently encouraging citizens to use the internet in their own language. Besides, this mission will create an ecosystem involving various agencies and startups of the central or state governments. All the components of this ecosystem will work together to develop innovative products and services in Indian languages. Let us now look at five questions based on the bulletin. Questions for this series are, first question is, consider the following statements. 1. Article 142 of the Constitution 
deals with the special powers of the Supreme Court to issue decrees or orders. 2. Article 161 of the Constitution deals with the judicial powers of the Governor. 3. The President is only authorized to pardon the death sentence of ordinary people. Which of the above statement or statements is or are not correct? 3 only, 1 and 3, 2 and 3 or 2 only. Next question is, consider the following statements with reference to the Interstate Council. 1. The Interstate Council was constituted on the Punchi Commission's recommendations. 2. Article 262 of the Constitution deals with the Interstate Council. 3. Prime Minister of India is the Chairman of the Interstate Council. Which of the above statement or statements is or are correct? 3 only, 1 only, 1 and 3 or 1, 2 and 3. Next question is, consider the following statements. 1. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework was launched in the Quad meeting. 2. This framework was first mentioned at the East Asia Summit held in 2021. Which of the above statement or statements is or are correct? 1 only, both 1 and 2, 2 only or neither 1 nor 2. Next question is, Recently, an investment incentive agreement has been signed between India and the United States, India and Australia, India and France or none of the above. Last question is, recently the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology organized a session on Digital India Bhashini under the National Language Translation Mission. Here Bhashini stands for Bhasha Interface for North India, Bhasha Interface for Digital India, Bhasha Interface for India, or none of the above. So for the time being, that's all in this bulletin. Do not forget to like, share, and subscribe the Shriya's Hindi, English, and PCS YouTube channels. At the end, let us have a look at few more events of the last week in other news. Recently, the government decided to reconstitute the Central Archaeological Advisory Board. It aims at strengthening links between the Archaeological Survey of India and the Archaeological Research Sector. The Union Culture Minister has been appointed as Board's Chairman. Besides five persons nominated by the Government of India and the former Director General of ASI have also been included in this board. Alexander Cunningham is known as the father of Indian Archaeology. The 75th session of the World Health Organization was held in Geneva from 22nd to 28th May 2022. Its theme for 2022 was Health for Peace, Peace for Health. World Health Organization has been working as an institution of the United Nations since 1948. At present, by 94 countries are members of the World Health Organization. It is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Recently, India's ASHA workers have been honored with Global Health Leaders Award. This award is conferred by World Health Organization. This award has been conferred to ASHA workers for ensuring access to primary health care services during COVID-19. Women ASHA workers work under the ambit of National Rural Health Mission. At present, there are about 1 million ASHA workers in India. After banning the export of wheat, the government has also banned the export of sugar. Moreover, India is the largest producer of sugar in the world. India is also the second largest exporter of sugar in the world after Brazil. Recently, the fourth edition of Shirui Lily Festival started in Shirui village located in Ukhrul district, Manipur. The four-day event has been inaugurated by Manipur Governor La Ganesan. Shirui Lily flower blooms only on the hills of Shirui village from the end of May to the beginning of June. Shirui Lily Festival is organized for promoting awareness about this rare Shirui flower and for encouraging tourism in Manipur. Traditional music, food, various games, etc. are performed during this festival. Reserve Bank of India has recently constituted a six-member committee under the chairmanship of former Deputy Governor B.P. Kanungo. RBI has constituted this committee to review customer service standards in regulated entities. The committee will suggest measures to leverage technology for enhancing customer service capacity in regulated entities, improving internal grievance redressal mechanisms and strengthening the overall consumer protection framework of RBI. 
रिसेंटली यूनियन मिनिस्टर डॉक्टर जितेंद्र सिंह अनवील्ड अ नेशनल पोर्टल नेम्ड बायो डबल आर ए पी फॉर बायोटेक रिसर्चर्स एंड स्टार्टअप बायो डबल आर ए पी स्टैंड फॉर बायोलॉजिकल रिसर्च रेगुलेटरी अप्रूवल पोर्टल इट विल फैसिलिटेट रिसर्चर्स टू गेट नेसेसरी अप्रूवल फॉर बायोलॉजिकल रिसर्च एंड डेवलपमेंट एक्टिविटीज This portal has been developed to grant more credibility and recognition to biological research in which each research will be identified by a unique bio double R A P I D. Recently, Child Online Safety Toolkit was launched for children. It aims at making the online experience of children safe and sound. This toolkit has been prepared by UK's non-profit organisation Five Rights. This organisation works on the priority of the rights and needs of children in the digital world. Recently the winners of Sangeet Kala Nidhi Puraskar for 2020 2021 and 2022 were announced. R Santana Gopalan will be conferred with his award for 2020, Hiru Varur Bhakt Vatsalam for 2021 and Krishnan and Vijay Lakshmi for 2022. The Indian Embassy in Beijing, China and the Consulate General of India in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Guangzhou organized the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. The play titled The Avadh Ka Train based on the conflict between Nawab Wajid Ali Shah the last ruler of Avadh and his wife Begum Hazrat Mahal with British East India Company in 1857 was staged on this occasion. 